are listening to Appalachian Words, the show about language in Appalachia and the Great Smoky Mountains. I'm your host, Jennifer Heinmiller. I am co-author of the Dictionary of Smoky Mountain and Southern Appalachian English, a historical dictionary that is over 1.3 million words long and covers everything from Ain't to Zonies Alive. If you're curious about that one, subscribe and tune in. Appalachian English is a rich language with a history stretching back hundreds of years. But outside of the region, there are more stereotypes than honest conversation about the culture. In an effort to bring this language and its history to a wider audience, I decided to start this show. Each week, I'll be reading and discussing entries in the dictionary and highlighting Appalachian culture and history, as well as talking about how the dictionary is set up and the process of compiling it. I welcome your questions, comments, stories, or any other message you'd like to send to me, although keeping it PG would be cool. Thank you so much to those of you who commented on the first two episodes, or first three episodes, that's right. Uh, We are now on episode four. I really appreciate your support and your feedback. So without further ado, welcome back to the mountains and foothills of Appalachia. This is episode four, as I mentioned, and our theme is school days. So if you're in the United States, you know it's back to school time. I think by this time, and it's the middle of September when I'm recording this, so pretty much all the schools are back in session, or at least the ones that follow the traditional American school year, with school starting somewhere around Labor Day, first weekend of September, Um, Although it gets earlier and earlier every year, I can't remember ever starting after Labor Day, Um, but I do remember back in high school, one year it started like around August 20th, and everybody just thought that was way too early. Um, When I was in elementary school, actually, my school didn't have air conditioning. I can imagine it would have been stifling to go back to school like the first week of August, which I see some some schools doing now. Um, I just don't think that would be a fun experience uh, without those kind of modern conveniences. I'm sure most schools have air conditioning these days, um, but really my experience wasn't that long ago. I mean, I'm talking about the mid 90s here, not like the 1930s or something like that. Um, I've always lived in pretty rural areas though, so maybe my experience is slightly more outdated than uh, other people my age. But even in college, uh, we had some pretty old buildings on campus, uh, like, I don't know, over a hundred years old. And I know if you're in other parts of the world, like that's nothing, but for American architecture, for something to stand like a hundred years later, that's pretty old by our standards. And I remember my junior year of uh, undergraduate studies, I had a class in the middle of the afternoon on the third floor of one of those rickety old buildings. Uh, It was a really neat building, really, like uh, wooden floors, and there was a historical theater attached to it. But it was just misery the first few weeks of class because there was no air conditioning up there. Um, This was Bowling Green State University in Ohio, if you're familiar. Um, It's northern Ohio, so you might be thinking like, I don't think it gets that hot up there, but trust me, we do have heat spells up there. Um, And it, it was one of these classrooms where the whole outside wall was like this big row of tall glass windows. And they were open, like the portion of the windows that we could open but it was still just like a greenhouse in there. And a few weeks into the semester, the temperature finally started to drop a little bit. And the professor said to us, you know, I didn't want to say anything at the time and bring attention to it, but I have a thermometer up here and the last two sessions of class, it hit 108 in here. Thanks for hanging in there. (laughs) I thought I was going to faint when he said that. Actually, I'm surprised I didn't faint during those two class sessions. My gosh. In Appalachia in the summer, it can get pretty hot too, especially in the southern mountains around where I am, where the moisture just kind of hangs there in the air. Now, typically, school wasn't in session in the summer, uh, historically, in Appalachia, and school terms were pretty short, sometimes lasting only a few weeks. Um, But education was a lot different from how we think about it today. 
And for one thing, it was really sporadic. Um, so you had some school periods uh, that would be really short. In many cases, school would only be held in the fall for maybe a couple of months. Um, really depended on the year, the teacher, the community. Teachers would come and go. They typically were not from within the community in a lot of these places. And education wasn't always free. So you couldn't just send your kids to a public school in your neighborhood like so many people are able to do in the United States today. Now, tuition-free schools did exist. Uh, it, they're what we would call public schools now, of course. But in those days, they were commonly called free schools as a way to differentiate them from what they called subscription schools or schools where you had to pay a fee in order to attend. In a lot of places, the free school would run for a few months in the fall every year, and then during the winter, your only choice was to pay to go to one of these subscription schools if you wanted to continue your, your education. Um, some areas, uh, such as parts of Tennessee, you had a system where elementary school was free, but high school was a subscription-based system. And I think this really explains why there were so many people in these rural communities in those days who only went to school through fifth grade or so. Um, you know, you talk to people and they say, you know, my grandfather, he only went to school till he was uh, 11 years old. Um, or you hear about so many people only going through fourth, fifth, sixth grade. I think if they lived in areas like that, that would be a big reason why. Uh, aside from the more obvious reasons, such as, you know, people would find a vocation uh, before 18. They would have to out of necessity, um, particularly the girls. They would be married quite young. Um, things just happened a lot earlier uh, back in those days at a quicker pace. And in those early days, of course, a lot more value was placed on practical skills like farming, uh, basic elements of survival such as keeping a farm, keeping a household going. I'm talking about, you know, way long ago, 1700s, 1800s. Um, so I'm sure you've heard about the education style of schools in early America, kind of these uh, pioneer frontier schools where they did this style of rote learning. So in this system, students were expected to basically just memorize material and spit it back out to the teacher. To do this, there was a lot of listen, repeat. There was a lot of chanting of their arithmetic problems, like uh, multiplication tables and you know adding sums and things like that. Uh, a lot of spelling out loud, going through these spelling drills, memorizing passages, and a lot of reading out loud. Uh, I think there was one period in time when every student was required to memorize the Gettysburg Address and recite it from heart in front of the class. I don't think that's typically the style that we do today. I mean, I know it's not the style that we typically do, but even, you know, as part of a well-rounded um, curriculum, I don't think memorization plays a huge role today. Uh, personally, you know, I'm, I'm pretty far out of school at this point, but I can't remember having to really memorize things like that other than the multiplication tables, of course, seems to be a perennial standby, doesn't it? Um, and then in high school, when we would have to memorize like parts of Shakespeare plays, like a monologue or something like that. Um, but these schools were typically small. Uh, but even so, even with, you know, maybe like 10 to 20 students, teachers would still find themselves with a schoolhouse full of students that ranged in age from small children uh, up through the teenage years. And they would have various levels of education. So some kids would come in uh, having been taught by their parents, uh, usually their mother. Uh, some of them would have attended school before, at a more regular school. Some of them not at all. And of course, you would have varying levels of interest, just as you do today, uh, particularly with the older kids. Um, I, you know, I would imagine the younger kids were generally more interested because uh, they're going there to have a good time. But the older kids, they might not be interested if it doesn't have practical application. Some of them might be thinking they would be uh, better off spending their time elsewhere. Um, 
Much like today, I suppose it's not that different in that respect. In the late 1800s, we started having some social developments that really changed things. For one thing, the Civil War ended, and the country was trying to find a kind of equilibrium. There were also massive developments in technology and industry as well. So these things were really working together and causing a big social shift. You also had other social movements uh, cropping up. Some of these came from within the country, some of them came from overseas. Now, one of the social movements of this time was called the Settlement Movement. And this began in the early 1880s in England. And this was a movement that was particularly interested in reforming certain social systems and really sought to bridge the gap between the rich and the poor. Now, this is not to say it meant to end poverty, but the activists involved in it worked to create social connections between the classes. So they wanted these classes to interact and really like get to know one another, one another's lifestyles, come to a better understanding. Um, So these activists, they went into poorer areas and set up facilities to improve the quality of life there. That was their main objective. So in doing this, they set up things like health clinics, um, daycare centers for the working adults to take their kids to, and of course, schools. Now, a lot of this took place in urban areas. Uh, Some of the bigger cities, Chicago, New York, the Hull House in Chicago, if you've heard of that, that's probably the most well-known of these settlement movement institutions in the United States. It was founded in 1889 as a way to provide education and other services, mostly for women and children who had immigrated from Europe. You have to keep in mind that during the period from 1890 to 1910, more than 12 million people immigrated from Europe to the United States. This resulted in a lot of poverty and rough living conditions, especially in cities when you just had these huge influxes of new people coming in, everyone's looking for jobs, everyone's looking for a suitable place to live, and it was really just impossible for these infrastructures to keep up with this massive amount of growth. Even though we did have um, some pretty positive things going on in the economy, and as I mentioned, technological developments. Um, But it was really some rough living conditions for a lot of these people. And people involved in the movement recognized the need for these kinds of services in Appalachia as well. So after they saw the success of some of these institutions in the bigger cities, there were certain people who were ready to bring this sort of thing into the rural areas. And one of the earliest settlement facilities in Appalachia was called the Log Cabin Settlement, which was actually near Asheville, North Carolina, where I'm located, and it was established in 1894. It was originally set up by a woman named Susan Chester, and she had been involved in the movement in cities in the northern states. So she had seen firsthand um, how these institutions changed lives, how they brought great things to communities, how they made people's lives easier. And she was able to experience some of that success herself. And she looked at Appalachia and apparently, uh, in her own words, she thought that the people of Appalachia were, and I quote, the purest Americans to be found. And so because of that, she set up uh, this uh, log cabin settlement to try to revive the weaving industry and set up a library for the community uh, and really just provide resources to this uh, very poor, very rural area. I'm really not sure about her commentary on the purest Americans to be found, Um, but she really influenced some people who came along later Uh, other volunteers who set up similar institutions. So it took off a little more strongly a few years after that. um, This movement was spearheaded in Kentucky, in particular, by two women, Catherine Pettit and May Stone. Pettit was from a farm near Lexington, Kentucky, and Stone was from Owingsville, Kentucky, 
So they were both native to sort of the greater Appalachia region. They weren't from, you know, the heart of the mountains, but they were definitely on the outskirts. They were definitely exposed and they knew what life was like in Appalachia. Both of them were from pretty well-to-do families. They both had great educational backgrounds, particularly Stone. She went to private school her whole life. Uh, She went to college at Wellesley College. I mean, these are fairly elite as far as the society went in those days in Kentucky. And both of them were members of numerous, uh, I guess what you would call ladies clubs, such as Daughters of the American Revolution, these kind of highly esteemed clubs. And they actually met through the Kentucky Federation of Women's Clubs, and they found that they had a lot in common, and together they made a plan and decided that they would volunteer through a program that the Federation had and go into more rural areas within Kentucky and teach school. So they put their plan into action, and for three summers from 1899 until 1901, the two of them taught school near Hazard and Hinman, Kentucky. Now, these were not formal schools by any means. Uh, They were actually teaching out of tents. (laughs) So it was more sort of a summer camp type atmosphere. Uh, But they went in there and they loved doing it, interacting with the community um, and just doing all they could to bring education to these people uh, and really get to know them and their customs. You might think this was kind of a colonialist move, uh, kind of a white savior type thing. I know this comes up a lot today, and it's often demonized, and rightly so in many cases. Don't get me wrong there. But these two women, they really seem to value the culture and the traditions of Kentucky. And Pettit in particular, she kept notebooks detailing uh, the music, the ballads and folk songs um, of her students, and she made notes on their speech. So even though she wasn't what we would consider a linguist today, she really uh, made some great discoveries about the language and documented this material that we otherwise might not have access to. And Stone uh, was interested in the handicrafts. So together they taught subjects like homemaking and uh, basic health care. And they also later trained some of the locals to become teachers themselves and they really incorporated these traditions of the area and people into the broader curriculum. So I really think, personally, I think it's it's a great thing that they ended up doing um, to really preserve this. And in 1902, so three years after they started teaching in the tents uh, during the summers, because the summer schools were so successful, the two of them were able to found the Hindman Settlement School. And it had the following goal, to know all we can and teach all we can. Stone actually stayed on for many years and she was principal of the school until 1936 when she decided to retire. And Pettit, uh, she went on in education as well and she co-founded another settlement school in 1913 that was the Pine Mountain Settlement School in Harlan County, Kentucky. I think it's just really cool that these two women took the initiative, they recognized the need, and they went in on a volunteer basis to help the people in their native state. I get the sense that they had a lot of pride in being Kentuckians um, and probably a lot of pride in being associated with Appalachia um, and just bringing the education to that area and at the same time, preserving the traditions that existed there. Pettit was also interested in um, vegetable dyes, I believe, uh, for dyeing cloth and things like that. And later on, apparently, her recipes for these dyes had a trickle-down effect, if you'll pardon the pun, and later books uh, in Western North Carolina were variation included variations of her recipes for these dyes so it's really cool to me how the cultures kind of played off of one another and they developed together so around this time you had other forms of education popping up uh, as coal companies moved into appalachia and got bigger and bigger 
And of course, coal is a huge topic, highly controversial. Um, you can't bring up Appalachia without getting onto that subject. And I, I will address that more in later episodes. Uh, but for now, I wanted to talk a little bit about how some of these companies established entire towns, which they effectively owned. And as part of these towns, they constructed their own hospitals, stores, and of course, schools. Um, so we can't ignore the existence of coal companies when we're thinking about education in Appalachia. So all of this is to say that there was really no such thing as standardized education or curricula in Appalachia for most of its history. Those are very recent developments. In the dictionary, we have a lot of terms relating to school and education and some of the customs throughout the region. And some of them are widespread, others are more localized, and I wanted to share some of them for this episode. Earlier I talked about rote learning and memorization, and these kinds of schools had a few different colloquial names. They're kind of fun. Especially later on when people were being interviewed and they're kind of looking back at their lives and uh, their memories of their school days. So one of the names for this kind of school was a blab school, and we describe it as an elementary school at which students recite lessons aloud in unison. There was also hollering school and shouting school. I get the feeling this was a little tongue-in-cheek kind of joking, but um, especially those two uh, last terms, hollering school and shouting school, I think it gives us a clue as to what the atmosphere might have been like sometimes. Probably got pretty noisy. And we have a few uh, really good citations to describe this type of school. From 1888, we have uh, William Perry Brown, who wrote an article he called A Peculiar People. He wrote, Until recent years, a system of what was locally known as blab schools, wherein was much in vogue, each pupil studied his lesson aloud. The teacher, perched on a high stool with a long hickory in hand, kept a watchful eye out for anyone who for one moment suspended the nasal drawl of all as audible evidence that he or she, quote, wore a gittin' of that thar lesson. I apologize for my butchering of the accent. <laughs> it's not my native English variety, but I hope you get the gist. Um, and another thing I'd like to mention about this quote in particular is the teacher perched with a long hickory. And by hickory, what they're talking about is, uh, as my grandpa would say, a hickory switch or a long stick, typically made of hickory or whatever else they could get their hands on. Because in those days, it was not unusual for the teacher to give a student a good whack if they were misbehaving. So you can imagine the teacher just kind of perched there, <laughs> kind of standing guard, just waiting for a student to step out of line. Kind of a different atmosphere from what we have today, I think. I hope. Uh, we also have from the wonderful Encyclopedia of Appalachia. Blab schools, so-called because students studied lessons by repeating or blabbing them aloud in unison or individually, were common throughout America in pioneer times and continued longer in Appalachia than in other parts of the country. The supporting pedagogical belief was that children learned better by doing lessons aloud. Because schools were usually confined to one room, the teacher had several age groups studying different subjects at the same time. While the teacher was involved with one group, the other children were directed to recite their lessons aloud, thus assuring the teacher that they were studying. So again, it must have gotten pretty noisy in there. And I'm sure that if students got quiet, the teacher took it as a signal that they weren't doing their work anymore. Probably in trouble. It seems like this was really an older type of school. Uh, by older, I mean just more historical prior to the 20th century. I thought that it lasted a little bit longer, but uh, we have a speaker in 1916 who reported that the day of the quote shouting school, like we talked about earlier, in which the pupils indicate they are studying by reading aloud has passed in the mountains. So by the early 1900s, this era apparently is already long gone. Another interesting word we have relating to education is books. 
This word was used in a few ways that I don't think are used anymore. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. I'm curious about this. So books uh, could actually refer to the period of time that students would spend studying at school or when they would be in class sessions. There's an interesting book called Troublesome Creek by James Still written in 1941. And he wrote there, they got a little sheep bell to ring in the schoolhouse before and betwixt books. So he's talking about before and uh, between the class session. So maybe like during lunch break or recess break. Um, that's what they referred to it as. And Jean Ritchie, who I talked about, I think in the last episode, she also wrote about this. And she gives a great example that shows just how common of a word it was during that time and in that place. I tried to hide my red face with the geography book. Cleve peeped over the edge. He had to whisper because it was in time of books. And I don't think, you know, without knowing that context just now, most people today would really know what that meant. I know I would be pretty confused, um, but it really makes sense. I love that usage of it. So books was also used as a signal that school was about to begin. The teacher would call out books at the beginning of the day or at the end of the lunch break as a way to call the students back inside and start their lessons again. Joseph Hall actually uh, talked to several people who gave evidence about this. Uh, one of the people he interviewed in 1953 said, Various calls were said to be used by teachers to call students into the school building, like, Books! It's books! Some of the practices in schools are probably still known by most people today, although I'm not sure how much they're still in use. So, if you're American, you probably know what a spelling bee is. And I know sometimes schools and communities still have these. Uh, in fact, where I live, um, I think they still do like an adult spelling bee even. Just kind of a, you know, just a throwback fun event for the community to come together. Um, I'm curious as to whether elementary schools do this anymore. They did one when, when I was in school. Um, but in some parts of Appalachia, the spelling bee and they also had a, a math version they had variations of it that were a little bit different from what we think of a spelling bee as being today. Uh, one of these contests uh, was called cross spelling, which was a school spelling competition, sometimes conducted by teams lined up and facing one another on benches. It's a little bit murky there, but there's a great quote from 1977 that gives a good description of exactly how this competition worked. Every Friday afternoon, the class would divide in half and take part in the cross bench spelling bee. The teacher would choose a girl and a boy to take turns choosing who they wanted on their side. Then she'd give us our words, and if you spelled it right, you'd cross over to the bench on the other side of the room. Then the teacher would tally the score to see who had crossed over the most times, and the one who had was the winner. Sounds a little anxiety provoking to me, I have to be honest. <laughs> even though I was pretty good at spelling when I was in school. I also wonder if it was always the same student winning every Friday, week after week. There's always that kid, right? <laughs> Although, I mean, I probably was that kid, truth be told. <laughs> um, but another word that I wanted to talk about, students were also referred to in general as scholars. I don't know of anyone who really uses this word anymore, and it really wouldn't apply to students in general, especially at public schools, I don't think. Uh, but it's interesting to see how language really changes over time, even such a short period of time. Uh, we have Davy Crockett actually writing about this term in 1834. He said, I had an unfortunate falling out with one of the scholars, a boy much larger and older than myself. Joseph Hall's interviewees also used this word when they talked about their school days. So over a hundred years after that, we have an interviewee saying in 1953, sometimes the teacher would board amongst the scholars. And this brings up something else that's pretty interesting. Now I mentioned earlier, teachers often came from outside the region. And so when they came in, they wouldn't have a place to live. 
So they stayed with the families of their students, usually moving from family to family after a week or some other certain period of time. The families would provide meals for them and other necessities. Sounds like a pretty convenient system in a lot of ways, but there must have been quite a bit of pressure for kids when it was their family's turn to host the teacher for a week. I wonder if this put the kids on their best behavior in the classroom? I mean, I would hope so for the teacher's sake. I used to be a teacher and I can see how that might have been an awkward situation. Like, if you're having dinner and suddenly the parents ask if little Johnny is an angel during class like he is at home. <laughs> so, one more tradition that popped up while I was researching education in Appalachia is a term that kids would shout to basically pick a fight. And I'm sure there were lots of these, you know, since time immemorial. Kids like to pick fights. It's what they do. This one I had never run across before. School butter. Yep, butter. Like the stuff that you spread on toast. I am not sure about the origins of this one. Um, if you have any idea or if you've used this yourself, please write into me. I would love to hear about it. Uh, but apparently this made students pretty angry. Uh, often it caused them to run and catch the offender, drag him to a creek, and forcefully duck his head under the water. Oh yes. So here's an example. From 1975, an interviewee for the Appalachian Oral History Project said, He was coming around there one day and he hollered, School butter! You know, that was an insult to the school. The teacher told the boys, he said, Go, go get him, boys. And they jumped out and took after him. He ran right up that hill as far as he could run and they run him down and caught him. Whenever they caught him, they brought him back and there was a big hole, a lot of water right along here above the schoolhouse. They ducked him in that hole of water. It's really interesting to me that you have the teacher egging these kids on to go and chase down the person who said that. Um, and there's another source from 1975 that says, School butter is an epithet of offense to a school group in rural western North Carolina. I know nothing about its origin. It has a tendency to provoke the school into taking the offender to a nearby branch and ducking him. And branch here uh, means a small stream or a creek. So, same situation, shoving someone's head under the water is punishment. I guess school pride was just as serious then as it is now. They just didn't have football teams yet. <laughs> Well, I hope you are enjoying back to school season, and I hope this episode brings up some fond memories of your own school days, even if they were nothing like those in rural Appalachia. If you have memories you'd like to share with me, I would love to hear. Please reach out to me at appalachian.dictionary at gmail.com or leave a comment in the comments section below. As usual, the show notes will be in the description box. Have a wonderful weekend, and if you are heading back to school come Monday morning, don't be late for books. Take care. <laughs>